Let me ask you a question. How do you handle arrival time in your classroom? For example, do all your students enter the classroom at exactly the same time? Or do they all trickle in slowly over time, one by one? And then what do they do when they enter the classroom? Now, this may seem like a tiny little detail at first glance, but the way your children arrive to your classroom and what they do when they enter through those classroom doors can set the tone for the entire day. In today's episode of Elevating Early Childhood, we're going to talk about how to incorporate fine motor activities into your arrival time to set you and your students up for success all day long. Now, just in case you're wondering why all this matters, let me tell you a story about my first year as a teacher, because it was my first and only year that I didn't have an arrival routine in place. You see, at my school, the students were usually dropped off by their parents. Now, some were dropped off at the front door, and then the children walked independently down to my classroom, and others were walked into the school building by their parents, and then everybody waited outside the teacher's door for the door to open. And our administration had told us we could open those doors at 845. So everybody is gathered around the door. And I bet you, as a professional educator, can guess what happened next, right? (laughs) Now, this was pre-9-11, so there were no security measures in place. I know that nowadays we're not allowed to just enter and exit the building whenever we feel like it. So I'm sure you know what happened when I opened the classroom doors. That's right. (sighs) All the parents and children came streaming through the doors, or flooding rather, through the doors, and made a beeline straight for me. And everyone was asking me questions, and it was extremely overwhelming, and I didn't know how to change it at the time. Now, I wasn't brave enough to change it in midway through my first year, but going into my second year, I knew there were improvements that I had to make to make things go more smoothly each day. Fast forward to 30 years later, and now I know what works and most importantly, what doesn't when it comes to arrival procedures and routines in the preschool classroom. Now, some of the tweaks that I made were very simple and easily changed. In others, they evolved gradually over time through trial and error as I gained experience. So here are the three things that helped me improve my arrival routine the most. First, I explained to the parents up front before the very first day of school that I wouldn't be able to have lengthy conversations at arrival or dismissal due to student safety concerns, right? I had a lot of kids and there was only one of me and it was very important that I keep my eyes on them. And that really helped alleviate a lot of those types of interruptions. Now, having said that, then I would also add, here's when we can have those conversations because you don't want to tell parents, I'm too busy to talk to you. (laughs) You want to let them know when they can. So then I let them know what hours of the day Uh, were acceptable to either have a phone call with me or a face-to-face meeting or to send an email. And then I would let them know if they were going to send me an email that you have to wait for a response until my planning time or after school, because I can't be checking my email while the children are there either. And if it's a phone call, I won't be taking phone calls during class time because again, I'm responsible for the children. And here's when you can call during my planning time or after school hours. Letting them know all of that up front is really really going to help ease that burden. The next thing I did was I encouraged a lot more independence from my children, right? They needed to be able to do a few things on their own in order to make the arrival process go more smoothly for everybody, myself included, right? So they needed to be able to take off their backpack and hang it on the hook. They needed to identify which hook was theirs. And then they needed to take off if, if indeed they needed coats where to take off those coats, how to take them off, where to put them, right? Because if left to their own devices, they will just drop everything on the floor. If you've got 20 or more kids, that's a big mess. So we do have um, in my shop, we do have an arrival uh, routine procedure with visuals um, that you can use that will really help facilitate and speed up that arrival process for you. And the third thing that I did was to make sure that my students had very clear step-by-step directions for what to do after they put their things away. So once they take off that backpack and that coat, if they have one, boots, if they're wearing them, whatever, all the accessories, once they've taken them off and hung them up or put them away, 
what do they do now, right? Because if left to their own devices, they're going to be sliding into first base on the carpet. They're going to be getting into all everything in the classroom. So the next thing I did was decide where are they all going to go? Or how am I going to channel them to, to do something? Because I still have other kids coming in and other kids that might need help or whatever, because even if you have 20 kids and they all arrive at once, it's still going to take a good 15 minutes for them to all get through this process. So for example, one of the first things they might do after putting their belongings away is find their name card and put it in the attendance pocket chart. Now you may have a different system than that, but whatever it is, is clearly stated up front. I like to have them find their name because they're always learning to identify their names and they're learning letters and matching and all of that good stuff. And then of course, putting it in a pocket chart and kind of graphing who is here and who is absent type of a thing. All of that has great educational benefits. So we find our name card and we sign in. And of course, it helps me quickly take attendance. And then they need to make a choice of some sort. Now, I've done it a couple of different ways. Whatever it is that you choose needs to be something that the students have practiced and they're already familiar with because you're not going to be introducing any new concepts during this time, right? This is going to be a time when you're going to be kind of flitting about. You're going to be helping kids. Sometimes kids have things to give you from their backpack, you know, for whatever reason, lunch money or whatever. So you're going to be flitting around the room. You're not going to be sitting down doing a small group activity. I mean, ideally, wouldn't that be wonderful? But realistically, it's not at all an option. So they're going to have to do something next. Since these activities are chosen freely and they're offered every day for a length of time, whether that's one or two weeks, depending on your preferences, there's no need to worry if a student isn't there, right, on time. And there's also no need to worry uh, who had a chance to do this activity and who didn't, right? Because again, these will be review these will be things they're already familiar with. You're not introducing new objectives. This is meant to be a stress-free experience for both you and the students. Now, this last piece of making a choice and choosing an activity, it may seem like small potatoes, but it's so important because it can have a big impact on the way the rest of the day goes in your classroom. And we all know that most children could use a little extra help in the fine motor department, right? So that's where fine motor tubs or boxes or whatever you want to call them come into play. Having these types of fine motor activities available to choose from after they complete those first steps in the arrival routine is really going to go a long way in helping them feel in control of that decision-making process. And it certainly doesn't hurt that the activities help develop those critical fine motor skills. So here are some examples of things you can use in your fine motor tubs or bins or boxes, whatever it is you call them, in a pre-K four-year-old classroom or in kindergarten. If you're in a three-year-old classroom, I recommend the first three things that I'm going to talk about. So the first one is Mr. Potato Heads. We all know and love Mr. Potato Head, uh, but I've had a lot of teachers tell me they don't understand the purpose of those in the classroom, or they seem to babyish, quote unquote, for their kids. So the thing about Mr. Potato Heads is they are great for fine motor skills, and they're open-ended. There is an endless way, a possibility of ways that your students can interact with the materials, right? They can change up all the arms, legs, noses, mouths, accessories, feet. They can make whatever they want using those materials. And it is a little bit tough to get some of those pieces in. So it's perfect for fine motor development. Oral language, they can talk to each other. That's an important thing I forgot to mention is that they should be able to talk to each other during these fine motor tubs or any kind of table time activities that you have during this period of the day. The next one is lacing beads. And I tend to use the ones that have letters on them just because can't hurt, right? <laughs> if they don't look at the letters, it's okay too. But I like the nice big ones that uh, are not a choking hazard. And lacing and threading beads is absolutely wonderful for those fine motor skills, that hand-eye coordination, all of the good stuff, right? Can't go wrong with those. Those are a staple in every early childhood classroom. And the last is Duplo Lego. Now, I like these because, again, 
no possibility of a choking hazard. They're much easier for little hands to grip and use than the little itty bitty Legos. I don't have time to keep up with all the little itty bitty ones. And what I find with pre-K four-year-olds at least is they always need help with those little itty bitty Legos. So Duplo is the way to go in pre-K four. Next up are poke pages. Now, <laughs> if you haven't heard of these, they are the be all end all in pre-K. Not only are they fun, but kids get to practice poking holes in things. What could be more fun for a child than that? Now in the picture on the screen, I have these nail art objects. I don't know what you call them. They're like tools, right? And I found these on Amazon for like a couple of bucks. And I have a set of six of these. Originally, I think the idea was that kids were supposed to use those giant push pins from the Dollar Tree, like the really big ones that you grasp in your fist. And that's all fine and good, but a lot of teachers have concerns about those. You'd really have to know your students well in order to use those. Then a lot of people use toothpicks, which I used to use in the classroom. And toothpicks work fine, just perfect, but they're really hard for little fingers to grasp, right? So it's a little, a little hit or miss with that. But then I heard about these nail art tools and I said, that's perfect. They are not sharp on the ends. There's a little ball actually on the end. And there's one side that's kind of got a larger ball and then one that has a smaller one. And so in the picture here, I have poked uh, holes on that page and I have a piece of craft foam behind the picture there. And you can't even see the holes. I used the small side and you can't see them. But once they poke the holes around the edges, um, they can take it to the window and look at the, what I like to call constellations through the little tiny holes. So these are super fun and they are excellent for fine motor skills because as they're holding the poking tool, practicing that pincher grasp. So super fun and who doesn't love poking holes and things? Something that they're told not to do at home, right? Then there's the hole punch activities that you can see here on the screen. And these hole punch activities are great for fine motor skills. In pre-K four, I probably wouldn't use those until a little bit later in the school year. For example, probably not September, October, maybe even November, unless you have five-year-olds at that point. Uh, it just seems to me like uh, they have a difficulty squeezing the hole punch. Uh, but of course there are kid-friendly hole punches that exist out there as well. And I forgot to mention the hole punching activity and pin poke activities or the fine motor poke activities. Those are available in my fine motor bundles. Some of the ones I'm featuring here are from my spring fine motor bundle. And those activities can be found in my spring bundle as well. So inside the spring bundle, there's a fine motor bundle. <laughs> so you can't go wrong there. And then Play-Doh task cards. Now I always take heat from the armchair warriors when I share these. So here's what I'm going to say about Play-Doh task cards. Why can't kids create what they want with Play-Doh? They absolutely can. But for anyone who's taught for any length of time in preschool, you know that you use Play-Doh every single day of the year, right? And it can get old and kids can get bored with it. So at that point, you can help them be creative by providing these prompts, if you will. These are prompts. Now we use prompts all the time in the elementary school. Uh, we're using prompts for test questions. We're using prompts for this or that. We even use prompts in pre-K four sometimes uh, for response to stories that we read aloud. So these are not to stifle children's creativity. I would never do such a thing, but they can be ways or avenues uh, to help kids come up with different designs or ideas to use Play-Doh with. And they also involve the rolling of the Play-Doh because Play-Doh is like one of the number one fine motor activities that you can offer children. So as they roll the Play-Doh out, I like to have them use their hands, their the flat palms of their hands, because it's pressing on what we call the palmer arch right here. And you as an adult can look at your palmer arch and see how it curves in. And little kids, there's kind of puffs out, right? It curves out. And that means the muscles there just aren't developed yet. And so we want to help develop the palmer arch by having them roll Play-Doh with their hands. Sometimes you can use a rolling pin. If it's one of the kind where they're rolling, it's just a flat roller like this and they're pressing on it as they roll. The ones that actually roll with handles, they're not as beneficial to children. You can use them, but they're not gonna be a fine motor activity at that point. But anyway, these Play-Doh task cards is what I call them, but you can call them mats, whatever you want. They also have an optional um, literacy element at the bottom that I cut off. Uh, because not all kids are ready for it. So you choose whether you use the whole thing or just the 
portion that has the picture on it. And of course, there's literacy elements in that as well. But that's great for fine motor. That way kids don't get bored with Play-Doh, right? Of course, pattern block mats. These are also available in my bundles at Pre-K Pages in the shop. Everyone's going to ask about the fancy tray. Uh, they had similar trays to this at Target two years ago. Have not seen them since. Haven't found them anywhere else. It's a real struggle. I'm sorry. And if anyone has any they want to sell, I'd be happy to buy them from you. And then, of course, pattern blocks. They're, they're considered fine motor because children are picking them up and gripping them, right? To pick up a pattern block as I was creating this photograph that you see on the screen. It takes a lot of work to pick those little flat discs and, and shapes off the table. As the kids are picking them up, they're using the different uh, components or the muscles in their hands to pick those things up and place them and flip them and turn them on the pages. Those are also in my uh, bundles in the shop. And then cutting practice, of course, this would have to be after your kids were introduced to the cutting skills and had gone through the cutting skills sequence. So maybe in the beginning of the year, if you're using one of these cutting practice uh, activities that I have, you would just give them the snipping portion. And then later in the year, you would use the fringing portion and then so forth. And then it goes all the way up to cutting shapes with all the different uh, angles and so forth. So depending on where, you are, where kids are in the continuum of this scissors practice or scissor skills continuum, then you can decide which ones to put out, right? So you have to have a good knowledge of your kids and their abilities before you would want to do that though. Now, the last step of setting up successful morning tubs, other than having several, right, that kids can choose from, is that they shouldn't be done for longer than 10 minutes, right? Especially in the beginning of the year in pre-K four. And then at the end of the year, maybe they can go up to 15 minutes again, because it's about their attention spans and the length of time uh, that they can usually focus and interact with things. Of course, they can switch freely between these activities at any time. So there are no assigned tubs. There are no forced rotations. It, this is just a simply free choice of these activities. Now you can put them in little tubs you know, on your shelves, or you can put them in plastic separate tubs that you have with lids. You can do a, an array of things with these activities. But the most important thing is that they're freely chosen and they're freely switched about. Sometimes teachers have kids go to each tub two at a time uh, because they just simply just don't have enough supplies, right? So I can see myself with the lacing beads. I probably only have enough for one tub. So then I would have two students using that tub. And for the potato heads, again, I have only a certain number of those, although I have way too many potato heads, more than I need. <laughs> so I would <clears throat> either uh, separate some of those into different tubs or assign two kids to each tub, things like that. And then of course the poke and the, oh, dot painting. I forgot to mention dot painting. I'll show you a picture of that on the screen now. So dot painting is great because A, it incorporates paint. What could be better? And as they uh, take the cotton swab and they grip it again with that tripod grasp and they have to dip it in the paint and then paint the dots. That is wonderful fine motor practice and exercise for those fingers that they're going to need eventually to hold a pencil with. Those, of course, would be individual things. And of course, you can print as many of those as you like. And all you need is Q-tips and some paint. And so I would probably have a little the little paint jar that I have pictured there. Um, those are from Crayola and Usually they would be on our supply list every year and I rarely use them because it's just this much paint, right? But these are perfect for morning tubs because then you can just put the paint in the tub and they can take the lid off and then put the lid back on. It's not really liquidy. It's more like a thick tempera. Anyway, those are some fine motor ideas. And of course, don't forget to take into consideration the ages of your students and the length of your day. So when deciding if you want to incorporate the use of morning tubs in your daily routine, those things are going to be super important. So there you have it. Those are my fine motor morning tub activities, if you will. I hope that you got some great ideas that you can take back and use in your classroom right away. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, Onward and Upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. 
It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.